I'm Daniel Heinerfeld. I'm 47 years old. And my relationship to Harry Shearer is that I'm a longtime fan, and I used to work at KCRW, so we were sort of colleagues. Uh, my name is Harry Shearer. I'm 66, and I've known Daniel because he used to produce uh, Which Way L.A., and so we've known each other from the, from the building, yeah. Ruth's house. So you've got a new movie. Can you say what it's called and what it's about? It's called The Big Uneasy. It's uh, after five years, I despaired of the national news media acknowledging the story of why New Orleans flooded in 2005, which had been meticulously investigated and documented by two independent teams of engineers and other scientists, which came to the conclusion, in the words of one of the engineers, that this was the greatest man-made engineering catastrophe since Chernobyl. Chernobyl's the big leagues. So New Orleanians had known a lot of this stuff because the findings of the investigators were piecemeal coming out in the local local press. But the national media had formed their template of the story. Big storm, city below sea level, mainly black people, mainly poor black people, hurt, ho-hum, move on. And, of course, the story was very different. So when I saw President Obama come here for his town hall meeting in last October, October of 2009, and call it a natural disaster, my head exploded, and I thought, I'd been blogging about this, I'd been interviewing these people on my radio show, I just thought, okay, that's not working. What breaks through the the clutter here in this country right now? Documentary films, if they're well made. So that's what I set out to do. Welcome to New Orleans. We all know what happened in New Orleans on August 29th, 2005. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, their defense was, this was a humongous storm. It was a cover-up. The Corps wrote, someday there's going to be a catastrophic flooding. They never heeded this advice. Congress had sent a clear message, don't mess with the Corps. Now they're building a multi-billion dollar wall to prevent what they said didn't happen. People didn't have to die. Where do things stand now if another big storm hits? Are the levees going to hold? If you listen to the Corps, their boast, such as it is, is New Orleans has never been safer. Now, this is from people who almost destroyed the city. <laughs> so I regard that as faint praise indeed, you know. We have in the film a, a whistleblower from inside the Corps of Engineers who, who was tasked to test and install the pumps that are at the heart of the new system. The, the pumps never passed the tests, even though they kept reducing the standards and helping the, the pumps to try to pass in every way possible. They were installed anyway, and she says they cannot withstand a hurricane. Aside from that, Mrs. Lincoln, everything's fine. So let's plunge into BP. Yeah. Um, what's your reaction to the way they handled the disaster after it happened? You know, the the question that I, I was involved in a lot was, is BP in any way different from other oil companies? Uh, you had this sense from, from a lot of reporting that BP had a pretty bad uh, safety record in the United States. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Dr. Bob B. of UC Berkeley, he just spends his life investigating uh, disasters. So he went pretty much straight from investigating the flooding of New Orleans to putting together the Deepwater Horizon Study Group. And I said, are they different? He said, yeah, yeah, they're much worse. So I take that to the bank. What amused me was, you know, uh, because I was going back and forth to Britain at this time, the frenzy in the British media, including the BBC, of denial that BP was a British company and how outrageous it was that Americans would suggest that it's a British company. After which, David Cameron, having been elected prime minister, came over to the United States and in his first meeting with President Obama, it, it was publicized that he was talking about, you know, how important BP was to the British economy. I guess it's a British company then. Do you, by the way, have a Tony Hayward impression? I did a Tony Hayward impression. I did a song called Macondo, named for the well. I should have been yachting I should have been chilling. I did the right thing. And they made me a villain. I want my life back. I want my life back. <laughs> yeah, he, he really was so unschooled in, in basic PR, it was kind of incredible. It was delightful. Yeah. It was delightful. You know, if you wanted to have an oil company villain, you couldn't have cast a better one than this. What, what about the media? I mean, you're a media critic. What, what about the way this has been covered? The fact that CNN seemed to have a house band that included Billy Nungesser and uh, a couple of other local politicians uh, every night, I thought was peculiar. 
you know, it's the usual. You get the politicians on and the scientists are, you know, given short shrift because they actually know what they're talking about. And I'm not picking on Billy Nungesser, but it's just symbolic that, that he became this event's Paris Hilton. But even with the criticisms that I've made of the coverage, the national media have not totally misconstrued the nature of the oil spill story as opposed to what they did with the flood story, which is totally misconstrued. I mean, they may well not pay attention to the findings of the scientists as they come out in the months to follow. We'll see. I know where my bet is. But they certainly ignored the, the findings of the scientists who looked into the cause of the, of the flood. So in, in a way, they, they have a high bar of incompetence to uh, get over. <laughs> right. And did you feel frustrated when the well was capped, when the flow stopped, and there did just seem to be this sudden exit from the room? That was the ambient feeling here, uh, is they're going to forget about us again. Um, what needs coverage now is the Kenneth Feinberg story. You know, how are they doing with the $20 billion? How's that claims thing going? Uh, as well as the scientists who are looking at the, both the short-term uh, effects for the marsh and the long-term effects in the deep water gulf. Oh, those are three stories that are really sexy by media standards. You know, we'll be looking for that real soon. And what about the community? I mean, have you seen, you know, the impact of this on people you know here? Just missing their oysters. <laughs> you know, I mean, this was not a, a, a devastation for New Orleans like it was for South Louisiana. And, you know, New Orleans not only goes down there to fish, but we eat out of that gulf. When P&J closed their doors, which is this oyster shucking company in the middle of the French Quarter that's been there for 135 years. That was a kick in the in the stomach to New Orleans. You know, you don't mess with our food. You don't mess with our oysters. You don't mess with our crawfish. You don't mess with our crabs. So you know, we've talked already to a couple people who just started this who kind of were just getting over mm -hmm. Katrina. They mm -hmm. just finished rebuilding their house, and then the husband's out of work. Mm -hmm. because, yeah. I mean... Oh, I mean, the, the fishing people, you know, they just got their docks redone. They just got their boats back. They they suffered badly from the hurricane. And and so many of them had just gotten back on their feet fully, you know, and we're looking forward to a really good s summer season. It's it's horrible. It's horrible. And uh, I hope that somebody is bird-dogging Kenneth Feinberg because, you know, he's the only guy standing between these people and uh, utter devastation. So on your weekly radio show, you I think you do it every week. You have news mm -hmm. of the warm. Is that right? Well, when, when there's news, yeah. Right. So w what can you explain what that is and why you do that? Um, it's, it's news about the scientific, uh, not about the predictions, but, but about the scientific findings that, that indicate the effects of climate change. Right, right. And I'm just curious, though, because you do, I mean, obviously you read a lot about global warming. Mm-hmm. You were climate change, about, we call it. Climate change. How do you feel about the actual prospects for real clean energy, you know, be, becoming a major player in the economy and changing people's thinking about that? I think other countries are going to be in the lead. I don't think we're going to be in the lead. Our politics is too beholden to existing industries because uh, nascent industries don't have the cash to contribute to political campaigns and uh, even declining industries uh, do. It's very hard to say, okay, oil industry, move aside now. We're going to focus on developing this stuff uh, when the oil industry is in the position of contributing to candidates and the wind farm industry isn't. That's just the way we are, you know. The other countries are going to take the lead and we're going to follow. But that's what a declining empire does. I, for one, look forward to our new Chinese overlords. <laughs> Um, I think we're out of time. Is there anything else that you want to say about the BP disaster? They're not a British company. Uh, many of their stockholders are in America. <laughs> um, and it's interesting that their original name was the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. So they're just in this long-term process of trying to get a cleaner and cleaner name, you know, over many, many decades. Uh, now they're going to have to find something cleaner than BP. Maybe just P. But it's interesting that BP among oil companies was noteworthy for uh, the extent and the elaborateness of its so-called greenwashing promotional campaign, you know, even to the point of not changing the name of the company, but, but identifying the initials as standing for beyond petroleum. And uh, it's interesting that a company culture of carelessness 
has succeeded in uh, demolishing that carefully tended green little promotional garden that they were building over the years. So if, note to companies, if you want to cultivate a fictitious uh, persona, a culture of carelessness uh, is going to get you in the end.